Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I'm Barry Rowland. In this episode, we'll be testing the new Tension R motor driven belt tensioning system from the guys at PT Actuator. This is the first time I've tested a motor driven belt tensioner. However, I've been using a belt tensioning system on my Motion platform for quite a while now. I'm looking forward to seeing what you get in a system that is powered by motors. Time to put it through the SRG's review process and see how it does. So, let's get to it. Well, let's take a closer look at this Tension R shoulder hardness tensioner from the guys at PT Actuator. First off, this is a rather large container here, or casement. It has a motor on each side, and they're attached to pulleys, and of course we have all the electronics and any kind of reduction gears, things like that, going on inside. And we'll get to that part in the look inside segment that we have here at the SRG. Now, this casement is aluminum. It has a brushed finish to it. And of course, it got some laser etching going on here with the Tension R, which is trademarked, PT Actuator, and also has a little Sim Racing Studio down here too, because Sim Racing Studio software, their tuning software, can be used to run this. Now, let's talk about dimensions. First off, let's see, about 19 and a half inches, or for everybody else in the world, that's about 495 millimeters for the length. For the height, we're looking at four and three quarters of an inch, or about 120 millimeters. And deep, it's four and an eighth, or 105 millimeters. So those are our basic dimensions, not counting these pieces here, which are the brackets that we'll be mounting to profile. This is made to mount to profile as with the other brackets that I also got. We'll take a look at those in a minute. But first, we'll look more at the casement here. Of course, we have the belts coming out the top, and these are two-inch usual kind of webbing you'll see on seat belts. So it's going to be a two-inch, and it has in the shoulder harness this pad that's built into it, actually sewn in. You can see the sewing there, a little bit of threads. Interesting that they went that route without using a shoulder pad that kind of, you know, wraps around and you can slide it up and down because, yeah, it kind of limits to where you're going to get the shoulder pad to be. Although this is long enough, I think it'll be okay. Got some paper on it there. But we'll just have to wait until we get on there to find out. We have, of course, the latches here, and we have our quick-release buckles here. We'll talk more about these and how they function again once we get to those segments. It has a button in this web right here, and the button... Not going to be easy to show this. I'm going to pull this out a little bit because they are independent motors. I can pull one out. You can hear the motor and the gears <laughs> pulling in there. Now I'm going to go ahead and take my little prop out here because I need to get a little closer so I can show you what's going on. All right, so we've got this little button on here. It's a screw, and we have these little... Oh, well, this is going to show up. Let me get this out of the way before I knock it off and make a lot of noise. My caliber's out of the way. We'll slide this a little bit closer. All right. So there you can see we have this serrated edge on here. So this is like a washer, if you will, that's threaded. And on the other side, we have the same kind of thing. We have some finger notches on there. So we can thread this on here on both sides. And of course, this is acting as a stop so that the motor cannot retract it any further than here. And what's going to do is going to hit these aluminum guides that they've attached to the top of the casement. And you can see they're anodized red aluminum, kind of matches the seat belt rather well, actually. So you could, I'm pretty sure, we have to wait till we do the look inside. You could probably run your own shoulder harness belts as long as they're two inch inside of here. But then you have to take the thing apart and you can see right here on the very top there, it says void if the seal is broken. So if you break that seal, then the warranty is void on this. So yeah, you have to, Take that into account when you're doing any of these operations. So, again, so far what I'm seeing here, everything looks good. The finish is good on it. I really can't find anything to really complain about there. Everything made shipping pretty well. Now, the end caps, and I'll turn this around and show you, are made of carbon fiber. And it looks like some pretty good weave there. I don't see any defects in it. It is a plate that's two millimeters thick. And of course, we can also see our interfaces for control. We have our power at 24 volts DC, and we have a USB mini port. And on the other side, 
It's just a flat plate. So there's not a lot to this, which is good. Simple's good sometimes, right? Now the brackets on the back currently are set up for a, get these belts out of the way, a 4160 panel. Typically you'll see those on the more heavy duty cockpits out there that have the 4160 panels. And just to remind you, I'll show you this one here that I have. Spider webs on. I had to pull it out of my storage. <laughs> so there it is, 4060. And of course, that is just four 40 series pieces combined into one piece, right? So we got four channels in there. So this is going to fit in here on our brackets. Let me just kind of slide that in here, see if it works. Okay. And it is snug, which it should be. That fit in pretty good, actually. So this lines up perfectly with the holes in our bracket. And of course, we have some countersunk holes here. We'll be using flathead M6 bolts. And on the bottom, we have the same thing going on. So this should give us a pretty secure mount to the profile if you're going to be mounting it to a 4160 profile. Now, you can also, if you don't have that, mount it to, they have some brackets that are for 4080 profiles. Get this back out of the way. and I'll pull my other piece of 4080 back out here. Of course, this is gonna be a lot thinner. It wouldn't fit very well. And we'll go to more detail on how we're gonna do the mounting once we get there. But they did send me an extra set of brackets. And as you can see, these are smaller brackets. And they're gonna be fitting on here so that it would accept a mounting position on a 4080 profile, which I'm also gonna do. I'm gonna mount this two different ways just to see how it goes. I'm gonna mount it directly to my cockpit. It does have the 4160 profile on it. And I'll also be mounting it to what I call my harness tower that I use for my seat belts on my rig because I have a surge DOF and my platform is back and forth. So I just tie my seat belts to a, or my harnesses to the tower and it doesn't move. So it tightens up dynamically when it moves. But well, again, we'll talk more about that as we get there. All right, so not much else to talk about here as far as what's going on with the box. What I'm going to do is show you what comes with it. You get two waist belts, and one of the waist belts has the quick release mechanism on it. And the reason I know this is going to be a waist belt with this on it, different seat belts have different configurations. So first off, if I turn this, this won't come out. <laughs> so there's always in a harness system a belt that won't come out that keeps this so I'm getting lost, right? So I can tell this is going to be a waist because it has the quick release piece on here and also the tightening function on here and this one also has it so this is going to be a waist belt too and of course they're pretty easy to click in here you simply just with the curve going into the piece like that that's how it will clip in very simple and then when you do a quick release obviously you do that and it falls out so it's easy to get in and out of the cockpit when you're racing and you're getting hot and you want to get out quick or you're on fire. <laughs> now, this is this is a five point harness and this is going to be the piece that's coming in from the bottom. So this is what we call the anti-submarine strap. But it is a one piece one. So this is a five point. This is going to click in the bottom like this. We'll have our waist over here like this. And of course, we'll have two left on the top for our shoulder harness. So easy enough, I'm going to be using, instead of, I'm not going to use any of these pieces here because I don't need to. I have a Schroth harness already, and wouldn't you know it that this pattern here will fit in the Schroth quick release on my existing harness, which is going to be kind of nice. That way I don't have to take my harness completely off. Although, if you don't already have a harness, you'll be wanting to use this. Now, remember, this is a five-point harness, so this strap will be going directly on the middle between your legs. Now, they do make other harnesses that are six-point, and the six-points have two straps coming in between your legs, so it gives more room or gives you more comfort in the groin area, if you know what I mean. <laughs> All right, so anyway, what else do we get with this thing? Okay. We get some bolts and nuts. We've gotten some, looks like some socket head caps in here. And again, when we do the assembly of the brackets and things, 
we'll get more into this and I'll show you exactly what we're using. I can see that these T-nuts are M8s and they are the spring, leaf spring type ones. It's not a roll-in ball because the profile that PT actuator sells with their cockpit assemblies or motion simulators, it is a deep channel that you typically is made in, in China. And that's what we'll see is those deep channel ones. So they require that leaf spring M8. And I've got a couple of bags of these. And I've also got the flathead. Looks like these are M6s. So it looks like the flatheads are M6. And I'm wondering if an M8, now that I'm looking at it, let's just test it real quick. I just happen to have an M8 over here. Yeah, for sure. It's going to be M6s going in here. I'll grab one of my M6s. That's actually an M5. That's not an M6. There we go. Now I've got kinds of bolts laying around here. Yeah. So we'll be using M6s, and I believe the other ones are going to be the same. Yes, M8 won't fit. Okay. So again, when we get to the mounting, we'll get more detail about that. So we get two bags of hardware, and we also get a USB cable so that we can plug this thing in. And one thing about this USB cable, it does have the micro USB plug on one side. Now this particular cable has a very thin housing here around the interface, the male interface that goes into the female. Of course, we have the usual A interface here for the USB. Now, the reason I point that out is the cable, some cables, USB cables wouldn't fit in this. It's a pretty tight hole, and I found this out by accident while I was checking things out. See the difference in this one? See how much thicker that is? So this one, believe it or not, it's not going to fit in here. So the reason I'm pointing this out is if you have a very long reach for your USB, you want to get a one-piece cable to make that trip, however long it happens to be, you want to make sure you get a thinner one like this, not a thicker one. Because this thicker one, I can go over here to the USB plug and push this in, or try to, and it won't. Because it won't interface with the, it won't clear the hole itself in the carbon fiber like that. So it's actually hitting around the perimeter of the hole. Just barely, though. It just barely won't go in. And I could probably take a razor blade or something and shave that down because it is kind of a rubbery material. So not the end of the world, but just things that I like to point out when I'm showing people things. And if I take this one, which is thinner, how much thinner, you ask? <laughs> in case you ever had to order one, this is 5.37 mil, and this one is... 6.6 .6. so yeah another millimeter thicker but if we use this one that comes with it and of course they know this clearance issue or they know how they cut this out so this is why they provide this one and this one will go in no problem if i can get it oriented properly i tell you these micros I'm not a big fan i like to see a USB C in there actually <laughs> but there it is and it goes in without any problem now of course we could file the actual opening here, too. It's just carbon fiber if we wanted to. But anyway, just want to show you that. So a decent braided type of USB cable here. The power supply. Obviously, we've already seen that this interface here says 24 volts on it. So this is a PT actuator labeled. I'm not sure who's actually making this. Power supply. And let's see our output in DC. Look on the bottom one here. Get my little pointer here. And you can see the output DC is... 24 volts, 6 amps max. So that gives you an idea how much power is in these motors. Because there's two of them, obviously. All right, nothing special about the power supply. Got a little LED that comes on, we plug it in, and we have the usual DC interface that's plugging into this part. And that fits without any issues very nicely. And they do give you a cord. Now this is a switching power supply, by the way, so... It goes from 100 to 240 volts. And they were nice enough to remember I'm in North America and gave me a North American 115 volt plug. So if you're anywhere else other than North America, you'll be getting the 220 volt plug. Right, so I guess that's about it. Not much to it really, as I said before. It's all contained in itself. So yeah, it's kind of just bolt it on, get your straps where they need to be, plug it in, get your Sim Racing Studio running, and off you go. 
let's go over how I'm going to be mounting this tension R case to my cockpit. My cockpit is a 40 by 160 on the base as far as the size of the profiles. And when I told them which one to send me, I told them to send me that one. So that means that my cockpit's base is this big guy here. This is a 40 by 160 profile, and that will fit right into the bracket spacing that they have here, just like that. And I'm going to put some T-nuts in the top here, obviously, because I had to put some bolts in. Now, they send you some parts with your kit. A couple of bags worth. Let me go with this bag. And they do give you some T-nuts. And these are the leaf spring type. At least that's what I call them. Leaf spring type T-nuts. So instead of a spring ball unit in here, they use a springy piece of steel. And you can see that spot welded onto the side of the T-nut. Now, the profile I'll be using is not a deep profile like most of the profile that I've gotten from China is the deeper channel profile. And they need this leaf spring type of T-nut to reach all the way to the bottom of the channel. Now, you can still use these in what I call regular profile that I get in North America, or some European profiles are like this. The channel is narrower, or not as tall, as the Chinese, but you can still get one of these guys in here by compressing the leaf spring a little bit as you put it in, and then you have to catch the back one and do the same thing, and it'll go in and still work the same way. So no problems with it working that way, but I'm going to be using my own T-nuts because I have a lot of them. They have the spring ball in them. I just prefer to use those. So they do give you the hardware for that. And they also give you these M6 screws. They are a four millimeter wrench size on them. They are flathead because remember the brackets that we're using here. Go ahead and use one of these extra ones instead of, this will give you a better angle anyway. They are countersunk on these brackets. So we can put these in here and they'll sit flush. So it'll look nice and pretty when it's sitting on top of your profile, whichever you use when you mount it. Now you can also get this for mounting a 4080 profile or mounting it to a 4080 profile. That's what you just saw here, 4080. Now they did send me some extra brackets here to do that if I needed to. So these brackets would replace the ones that we've got on here already spaced out for the 40 by 160 profile. And we would put these on here like this. I think I believe one goes on the bottom like this. And then we have another one, and that's going to line up with the edge, it looks like to me, of the bottom of the casement. But we also have some holes up here and screws that will mount here, like this. And it won't protrude above the casement, as you can see, like this one does. It's actually going to be below it a little bit. And that's okay, because the casement will be sticking up. You want the case to be sticking up above your profile if you're doing the 4080 install because you know you don't want it sticking down underneath because you might run into something under there. You might have some other things hanging down lower than your profile is. So yeah, this should be sitting above it. So it'll be sitting like kind of about this far above it, it looks like to me. I'll put this in here. Let's go ahead and just kind of line this up. So it'd have about that much sticking above the profile of the base of your cockpit if that's how you end up mounting it, right? Pretty simple stuff here. Now, of course, when you order it, you need to tell them what you need as far as 4080 or 4160. Now you can change it because you can see I have the brackets here, but to change it, we're going to have to open the case because there's no way to get to the other side of these screws or bolts that are in here without being inside the case. And we'll actually see that when we get to the look inside segment, we'll take a look at all that stuff, find out how that's done while we're inside looking at everything else. So. That's pretty simple, right? I'm just going to mount this to the 4160 piece. Go ahead and put my T-nuts on the top part of the profile, the bottom part, which might be a little tricky because, yeah, it's on the bottom and I can't really see it. I'll probably put a mirror in there or something and shine some extra light in there so I can see through the mirror the reflection of where that T-nut is and go ahead and put the bolts in. I found that's the easiest way to do that in an upside down situation when you're bolting something together. Now, I'll be running these shoulder harnesses on my shoulder harness tower. I currently have on my rig, you guys may have seen it in some other videos, and that is where I attach my waist and shoulder belts for my surge element that I have on my 60OF PT actuator motion platform. And what that does is when the surge actuator pushes forward, 
and you have your belt cinched down tightly like you would in a normal racing car, if you get in a race car, you, you get those belts very tight because you don't want to move at all when you have an impact. So when you tighten them down like that, and then that actuator pushes the prop pit along those linear rails, then yeah, it squeezes the waist and the shoulder at the same time, which gives you a good representation, as close as I've seen of the real thing, or actually felt rather, not really seen, to being in a car when you're in a heavy braking threshold. And then you, you're kind of float, doesn't give you the float from the G-force obviously, but you do feel the belts tighten on you at the same time like you do in a real car. So it's very convincing really when you have it set up that way. So I'll be using these to go over that. And this is also gonna give me the right angle I want on my shoulder. I don't want this belt to be, let me go ahead and show you this. And I'll, I'll probably say this a couple of times that once this belt is going up from this casement, most guys are mounting these. So the belt comes straight up from here. It goes into the back of the seat where the holes are for the shoulder harnesses. And so it's straight up from here in there. So there's no, there's no angle there. So it's pulling straight down. What happens is it pulls straight down on your neck muscles, which is obviously not what you want to do. You can do that, but yeah, it's not going to feel as good as if it was pulling straight back. Like in a real car, a track car, a race car, they have the roll bar behind the driver's shoulders so that it comes straight back. So when they get pulled, it's not pulling down on their shoulder muscle or their neck muscle that's connecting between their shoulder and their neck. So that can be very fatiguing, might even damage their neck. <laughs> so that's why they do it that way. But we'll talk more about that once I show you how it's mounted and finished. Now, I'm going to use these guys on top of my profile, harness tower as I call it. And this is a very hard nylon roller and it has some bearings in it. I'll show you when I have it taken apart here. You see we have some shielded bearings in here on each side. And this is a very, very stiff, hard nylon, so it doesn't give at all, in other words. So I, it won't have any dampening effect, like if I had a rubber one or something like that. Even though the motors in this are very powerful, I don't think it really, no matter what you do, these motors are not going to have any problem, I would say, putting plenty of torque on your front of those shoulder harnesses. But we'll see once we're in running it. But anyway, that's what it looks like. It's just got a bolt goes through it, and I have this mount. Now, when I got these, the mounts did not have these holes in them here. So I went ahead and centered them up and drilled some holes here so that I could mount them to profile. So they'll sit on my profile. I use this as a, yeah, I'll use this because this is the way it sits. This would be the shoulder part of my harness tower. And I'm going to mount these on the front like this, or not really front facing, not on the back, so that the rollers are sitting in here like, well, let's go ahead and put a whole one up here. Sitting up here like this. Or maybe like this. Might put the holes to where it's sticking up a little bit. So the belt will come up and go up inside of here and then come across the roller and then go in through the hole so the belt will lay on top of my shoulder. So when the belt comes up like this and it pulls back, it'll be pulling straight back on my shoulder. Easier to explain once we have it all set up, but you get the idea. Now these rollers are kind of big. You can probably get some smaller ones. It's just, I had access to these what these are used for in real life is they're guide rollers. So if you have an electric fence that slides back and forth, like to get in a driveway or a, you know, some kind of a company security parking lot, they'll have these rollers in here that those gates will kind of bang up against. They're like guide rollers. So they don't really hold the weight, but they're just guiding the gate, keeping it centered as it goes back and forth. That's all that is. 30 bucks for a pair of these. So not that much money to invest. Drill a couple of holes in the brackets. And yeah, easy to set up. All right, so what else can we talk about? I guess that's about it. It's pretty simple what we're doing here. And what I'll do now is go ahead and get everything bolted up and configured. I'll get my rollers attached and the belts run through them. And when we come back, we'll take a look at how all that went. All right, so we'll go over the final configuration I have set up here for this Tension R unit. We'll start at the bottom. The cabling was long enough, this USB cable, reach all the way to the front of my cockpit and go over to my powered hub, so no issues there. And of course the power cable was long enough, no issues there either. So that was a welcome discovery that I didn't have to do anything as far as extensions. 
we have it attached with the brackets our m6 bolts and nuts are in here and of course i have the same thing on the bottom it was a little tricky to get the bolts in on the bottom brackets because obviously this is upside down <laughs> but if you put a mirror under there that's what i did i just put a little hand mirror and put some separate light source under there and i was able to look up upside down and get the key nuts in and get the bolts in without too much drama it was fiddly i'm not gonna lie to you but you know once it's done it's done you're not, probably not gonna be changing it very often so that's mounted one thing you'll notice about the shoulder harnesses coming out of here is the buttons are not in the same spot which doesn't matter really because it's never going to move so much to cause those to hit those red pieces i've already done some test running so i know i'm good there the important part here is that the shoulder harnesses themselves where the padding starts are at the same distance and they are when they come in here and also it's important that down here we are at the same level on our attachment points and you can see if i straighten these out and these are pulled all the way tight so i can't pull these up into this buckle anymore it's already done so you can see how even these buckles are sitting on the seat and that's important too keyboard out of the way here so that's all good again i've tested it you can see i'm using my standard trough waist belt and six point piece down there and i'm leaving it attached to our harness tower because i'm going to test this without surge first because i want to test it as most people will be testing this and using this and that's in this configuration right you just have it attached to the bottom of your cockpit somewhere and the belts are coming down and that's it so you're just experiencing these belts pulling which means we're not going to get the pull from the waist belt that you will get if i was using the surge element now we'll try to use the surge element after this and see how it integrates with the shoulder harness i don't think there's going to be too much problem with that now that i've looked at it and when i was putting everything together you're thinking about how this is going to work but initially all the testing is going to be done with just the shoulder belts moving and these will be stationary so yeah they're not going to move like they do normally for me on my surge system when i have it in that configuration what else can we talk about here the angle of this I've seen a lot of these shoulder harness units, not necessarily PT actuator, but just a lot of them out there that people mount them exactly where I mounted this, but the belts are coming straight up, coming into the holes or the shoulder harness hoops, whatever you want to call them, access ports. And yeah, they're pulling straight down like this to the unit. Now this is not optimal. I would not do mine that way. And that's when I went to the trouble of getting these rollers and all that stuff done so yeah i want it to be pulling straight back because this is how it's done in a real car the roll bar is back behind the driver's seat back here like this simulated roll bar so that it doesn't pull down on the neck muscle and that's what's going to happen when somebody has it straight up like that not optimal obviously you want some kind of an angle back here because it's going to pinch your neck over time and it's going to maybe cause you some problems, maybe not, who knows. But yeah, I think it's important that how you set these things up is done correctly. So it doesn't cause you any stress to your body while you're in there driving for two hours. <laughs> All right, so yeah, everything went just the way I thought it was as far as getting these things secured. And again, I'm looking forward to using it just as the shoulder harness. And then I'm going to try to implement my surge so I get the waist belt pull again. Because right now, the only way these waist belts are going to be tensioned is towards the top of the seat when these shoulder harness straps pull. Because they're not pulling this way anymore, so you're not going to get that pressure anymore that I had before. Of course, if you've never had it, you wouldn't know it anyway, so it doesn't matter. But I'm going to notice it right away, I'm sure. But, again, I can't test it with the surge yet because I want to duplicate as best I can what the most people in fact, probably 95% of the people that buy these units are going to be using them that way. They won't have the surge element in their cockpit that they can use also. So it looks good. I think it's going to work fine. I've already tested a little bit. What we'll do now is just get back into the cockpit and we'll go through the calibration process. We'll see what the options are on the Sim Racing Studios app that controls this. So yeah, 
we'll go ahead and get to that segment next. Now for our look inside segment. How I'm going to do this is obviously we have two pieces on this case here. We got it. You can see the seam across the top and we have another one on the bottom there. Get in the light. There it is. So what I want to do first is a little exploratory surgery here. I'm going to pull these screws out in the end caps and see what's in here. And then I can go on from there. I've got a feeling these screws on the top here. I'm going to have to do something with those. But these are two millimeters for the wrench size for these little button head deals. So what we're going to do is go ahead and pull those out. I'll pull one off and see how that comes off. And then we'll see if I can get this to where you guys can see what I'm doing. It's pretty simple here. I'm just pulling some screws off, obviously. I'll start with the bottom here down here. Go ahead and spin these out. We'll get them all four off. See how long they are. They look to be pretty long. They keep coming out. There we go. So that's what we have. And that looks to be about a three millimeter screw. And we have again a little button head on top of it. Go ahead and get these other three out and see what we have. All right, so there's the carbon fiber plate. And it is two millimeters thick. Put that aside. And we'll take a little look in here. Hopefully you guys can see a little bit what's going on, but we'll see more as we go along here. I can't really do anything with the belts because obviously they're attached internally here. And we can see some stuff in there. Not a whole lot. We can see we've got a circuit board up here on the top. It says right on it, which means the right side motor. And when we mount this tension R, that would be the right side. Yeah, not a whole lot to see from this angle, but we do have a circuit board up here. And I can see all the way down at the end, we have another circuit board there. And what I want to do is pull one of these halves off and leave everything attached to the other half, if I can make that happen. I'm assuming I'll be taking this one off. But even then, i got to watch, be careful how I take it apart and rest it so I can show you stuff. Because, yeah, these belts are still on this side, these little keepers here. Unless I can take them loose and slide the belt that way, but I don't think that's the way this works. But that's the cool thing about exploratory surgery, right? So what I'm going to do is go pull the other cap off. And you can see here what I'm talking about. This circuit board over here is attached with a screw here. We have two of them here. So if I want to take this half off, I would have to take these two screws out on this end. And on the other end, we have the same kind of thing, but I'll be taking one screw off here and try to leave these circuit boards attached to the other casement. At least that's the idea. So when we get back, we'll see how I managed to do that. So this is what the inside of a tension R assembly looks like. We have a motor on each side, of course. This is the left motor over here, the right motor over here. We have a circuit board over here supporting this motor or controller board controlling the motor. We also have a controller board back here, but you notice we have something extra here on the top. We have the controller board for the motor over here, but we also have the power board, combination power board, and another controller board in here. Well, I can show you that. Let me pull this down a little bit. Try to keep these halves. I can't really do much with the belts here because it's got these buttons in them. And yeah, it won't let them go through there. Even if I took those red pieces of aluminum off, same thing would be happening. So anyway, this is the DC power supply plug coming in. And of course, that part of the electronic board is the power board or power circuit. You can see it has a big 35 volt, 222 microfarad capacitor sitting in there for smoothing duties. And we also have another USB board in here. This looks like a little add-on board but it's been soldered on. So anyway, that's part of the controller board there, the main controller board. And then this board here will talk to the other board over a CAN bus. I believe that's a CAN bus set up in here. Could be wrong, but it looks like it to me it could be. And it goes all the way over to the other side. And we have a couple of LEDs on this side here. We got a green one and a red one that we can't see when it's running. So that's all sealed in. And we have the cables coming back and forth to communicate. We've got some RJ45 connectors down in here. I don't know how you guys can see that, but there they are down in there. So a very clean layout. The belts themselves, now that's what I was wondering. Two things here on this assembly. The belts themselves, can we put our own belts in here? If you wanted to, you didn't like red or whatever the reason you wanted to do it. And what I'm going to do is take one of these 
and roll it out. I believe that, yeah, we can do that. It looks like the motor here is, first off, it's a little servo motor, as you can see, right? And this probably is a stepper motor, I would imagine. Got the controller on the back here in this plastic part. And then we've got a gearbox, if you will, a little gearbox sitting in here between the motor and the pulley. So that's what you hear when it's up and running and you hear that noise. That's what we're hearing. All right, you're hearing this thing, because if I pull it, you can hear it here, too. Hear that? I'm going to pull this. Go ahead and keep pulling it. There we go. All right, yeah. So you can put your own belt in here. And how this works is, you can see we've got three holes in this pulley. And we've got set screws in them. And each one of these holes, I can see down inside of there, there's a set screw. So you take those set screws loose, then this can slide out. And it looks like, yeah, there's no slot on the other side, so it bottoms out in there. So once it's in there, you use these set screws to clamp down on that. And I can see the set screws down in here. It looks like the set screws, yeah, I would think that there's some kind of a metal bar in here that the set screws are pushing against. And I don't know if you can see that in there or not, but it's, you may be able to see the angle and see the set screws in there. One, two, three. And there's a metal piece of metal down in here that's pushing and locking this belt up against the other side of the pulley in here. So, yeah, simple enough. You just take those set screws loose, pull this out, put another one in, and put the metal bar back in there if you can do that, or put your own piece in there, cut your own piece, and then that would these set screws act as a clamping mechanism so it doesn't, you can't pull it out, right? So pretty simple there, and I'll just roll this back up when we're done. So, and in fact, I wanted to kind of leave it like this so I can show you guys the brackets. Now, if you wanted to change the brackets on here, remember we talked about in the mounting these brackets. We also have these brackets here that are made for a 4080 profile, and they have the same kind of holes that these brackets do. When you look down in here, I can see that there are some socket head cap screws in here or bolts. Three over here. There's three over here on the top. And then we have three more over here for these brackets over there. So that means we would have to take these loose to get the brackets off and put the other ones on. Not the easiest thing to do, but definitely doable. Just have to take your time, be patient. I'm sure you could get it done pretty well without too much trouble. But yeah, it looks like it's not gonna be the easiest, simplest thing to do. And you do have to open the case to do that. What else can we talk about here? Not much. I'm looking for some branding on the motors. This one's kind of washed out here. Let me see what we got on the other one. Gotta be careful what I'm doing here. Oh, there we go. Hey, well, let me take this little plug out of here. I'm going to have our RJ45. And this plug is a communication plug between this board and the board way over here. Okay. Go ahead and slide that out. And that's uh, RJ12, it looks like, not a 45. All right. So now that I have that out, we can actually pick this up. And I'll let you guys have a peek at the labeling that's on this motor, if I can. There it is. Not a very good way to see it, but I'm just going to hold it there and I'll read it out to you once you, you can actually freeze frame it and see it. it. might be too dark though, but I'll read the number on it here. It's a BCL42060P4-1000E-245. And that's it. It doesn't have any other identifying marks on it except serial numbers and things like that. It's got some uh, Chinese writing in there, so yeah. Not much we can tell about it, but there it is. All right, but I can tell you they're very powerful. I've already run it. I always run everything and test everything and do most of my shooting before we ever get to the look inside segment, just in case something goes wrong, right? So yeah, very powerful little motors. Uh, you know, when I opened this and looked at the size of the motors, I was thinking to myself, wow, you know, these things really do feel more powerful than the size looks <laughs> when they're pulling on your shoulders. But we'll talk more about that once we get to those segments in the review. So yeah, nice clean layout here. Nothing I can see that I really don't like, I think. You know, everything's well done. It's good coating inside and outside. I don't see anything just hanging loose, any wires sticking out to where they shouldn't or anything like that. All of the uh, wire blocks here are well done. Everything looks to be pretty well done here. So yeah, nothing to complain about on the look inside segment, I think. All right, guys, we're doing the calibration process in this segment. 
and I have everything attached. And if I go into Sim Racing Studio, start it up, go under the Setup tab and go to Hardware, this is what we should see. We have a green check. Let me scroll down to my belt. There it is right there. We have a green check mark next to belt. That's what we want to see. If I hover over it, it tells me on, it's on COM port 18, and the Sim Racing Studio can see it. Now, to calibrate, you want your belts tight on the waist. I have my waist belts tightened down like I would normally drive. And my six-point assembly of part of the six-point harness is also tight. So it's holding the belts from rising up, which is a good thing. A four-point harness won't do that. So as I discussed before, you want to make sure that yeah, you get something with a six-point on it. Five-point's okay, too, but six-point's more comfortable. Anyway, so the shoulder harness, however, has three fingers worth of looseness on the shoulder harness itself. And that's in the instructions, they tell you to start your calibration process from there. You don't want it already tightened down. You want it loose so it can pull some belt up and sense what's going on with the tension, I guess. So we have it all set up. Green check. And I'm going to turn it on on the switch here. And I should get a calibration window pop up when I do this. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And I get a question mark next to the belt. My calibration window popped up. And I'm going to calibrate. And let's see what happens. All right. So you saw it tighten down pretty good on me. And then it let up a little. And now I'm in the position where I'm ready to start driving. So the belts would be working now if I was in a live session. We're going to do a live session after this just to see the capabilities of the system itself. Now you can go in and test the belt down here at this point. You hit start test. And then I can go over to my keyboard and use the arrows. I'm going to click on test and you can see it jumped to five. But this is how you test the belts moving back and forth. You can see them moving. Ah, <laughs> yeah, That's pretty good tension. And you'll notice that my seatbelt harness tower that I use for my regular harness system when I'm using to maximize the surge system in the PT Actuator 60OF motion platform, it is made to bend back and forth or move back and forth and flex at the top like that to provide a little bit of dampening to the belt. It's not affecting what I can feel, maybe just a little bit, but not much at all because remember the belts are still directly attached to the pulleys that are inside the casement for the tension R box, and they're on these hard nylon pulleys, and then of course they're coming across my shoulders. So I'm not losing much. It might look like it because it's going back and forth, but believe me, these motors are powerful enough that, yeah, <laughs> you feel everything that they can give you, and maybe some that you don't want, but we can actually turn that down. Calibration power and calibration retraction is the other tuning we can use here during calibration. If it's calibrating too, tight on you, you can play with the retraction and the power, or if it's not tight enough, you don't feel like it's tight enough, you can increase it. And this only affects calibration though. So if it's too tight, you can go down on the power or the retraction distance and make it easier for you there. But again, that only applies to the calibration process. So there we are, we have it calibrated, everything is working, so we're good to go. What we're gonna do next is get in and do a little live tuning session, I'll get in and play around with the sliders while we're running around Sebring, which has a lot of good bumps and stuff in it, that we should be able to get some good visuals on the capabilities of this Tension R belt system running through the Sim Racing Studio software. All right, so we have the Sim Racing Studio application up in the tuning mode. You can see I have tuning highlighted. We have active belt selected, and we have three things we can tune here. Surge, sway, and heave. We have on or off. We can just switch them on or off if we want. We can reverse direction on either the sway or the heave. And we have the power on the top line here as far as sliders, and we have smoothing on the bottom. Default is 1015, 1015, 1015. So what we're gonna do is go out here on the default and do some running over a little bit, and you guys can watch what the belts are doing as I'm running around. So let's go ahead and get in this Ferrari 488 GT3. This is the legacy car. We are in Sebring in iRacing, of course. We got lots of good bumps and things going on here. So we'll just go ahead and get out on the track. I have motion turned off for the motion system. I have my wind turned off because I don't want to affect my microphone. And let's go ahead and see if we can get these belts working here. So you can see it breaking right away. It works pretty good. It is at 10, it's pretty good force. Let's go ahead down this deep braking zone here and feel it, see what that feels like. Yeah, that's, that's really good. <laughs> These motors have a lot of power. And again, as I said in the calibration segment, you'll see this tower moving back and forth. 
but it's not it's dampening a little bit it has to be because obviously it's moving some but because the belts are running through those hard nylon rollers and then of course they're attached directly to the gearboxes and the motors in the tension R casement yeah you still feel everything that this system can put out all right so that was braking and you can see it really can squeeze you pretty good and we're only at 10 so there's a, there's a lot more left in this so what I'm going to do is <laughs> go ahead and turn this up just to see what it'll do. To Let's go to 15. Why not? Let's stay on 15. There we go. So that's 15. Now let's go ahead and go around the next corner here, this hairpin, and then we will... Wow, just tap it on the brakes. <laughs> yeah, big difference in the power. A lot more power now. So this system, just at 15, has more power than I think I would ever want in a braking system. And this is, I'm used to surge braking on this motion system using the regular surge harness tower with my regular harness. Yeah, this is definitely more powerful. One more brake zone here and you guys watch it again. <laughs> all right so i'm going to turn that back down that's really a lot more than you need now one cool thing about surge is that it's not just a gimmick in other words it's not just a feel that you get from these shoulder harnesses it's useful information or data that you can use to help determine like you never could before because remember usually in braking zones our direct drive wheels what we feel maybe we, if you have a motion system you know you got some pitch in it uh, but yeah these belts give you information, and so does the static mount system when I'm using the Surge on the 60OF system. Same thing happens because it's all dynamic. You feel what the car is doing under braking even more because you have a lot more input because of what the belts are doing. So these belts, they'll get tight, they'll get loose based directly on what I'm doing with this brake pedal. So if I'm a little bit of the brakes, it'll just lightly go down. If I hard, it'll go down obviously a lot and it pulls on me very tightly. I'm glad I put it back to 10 for that because it feels more natural to me at 10. But then again, it's completely subjective, this kind of stuff. So whatever suits you. But as I brake hard first and then I come off of it on turn in, in other words, I'm doing my trail braking, you can feel that dynamically in the shoulder harness belts. The same way you can feel it in a surge system like this when I have the belt statically mounted there. So I'm used to feeling this. Now what I am missing, I'll tell you right away, is I'm getting any pull on the waist belts where you do get that if you have the waist belts hooked up in the static system on a regular surge system that I normally use. So I missed that part of it. Shoulders are good, but right away I missed what's going on at the waist because nothing's pulling there. Now, what I'm going to do is run the motion system with surge turned on when I'm driving, and I'll make some comments about that, how it feels. That will engage the waist belt feel, and I got a feeling with this up here, I should be able to tune this to where one's not pulling more than the other. In other words, get them to match. And that's what I'm looking forward to trying out when I'm doing my driving segment. But right now, this is all about just the tensioner R system. And this is the way to test it so you guys can watch it on a static platform. Because 99% of the people who get this, I believe, are going to be mounting this to a static cockpit. And yeah, so that's why I'm showing you it this way. All right, so we know that the surge works really good. Uh, we have plenty of power in it, but we also have a couple other effects here, and let's talk about sway. All right, so that's the belts pulling. As I'm going around here to the right-hand corner, the left belt, you can see it, is pulling. So what that's supposed to do, and if I go back to the right, let's do the right, you can see that one's pulling. Left, right belt, left belt, right belt, depending on which way I'm turning. Now, what that's supposed to simulate is you in a turn and yeah just giving you a simulation that you're turning in that side now if you've ever been in a real circuit car race car type car and you're strapped in in a six point harness very tightly and you're going around a sharp turn what you really feel the belt might you might if you focus on it you might feel some difference in one side of the belt or another as far as tension goes but the tension doesn't change on your belt what you will feel is g-force pushing you into the lumbar and the mid body where your rib cage is and all that you'll feel that pressing into the seat you won't really feel anything going on with the shoulder arms at least 
I can't remember ever feeling anything there because you're being compressed inside the seat up against the side of it. So the last thing you're thinking about is what the harness is doing on your shoulder because it should be nice and tight. All right. But if you don't have a motion system, and even with a motion system, because remember, we don't have G-Force, I can see where this could be pretty cool. As I'm going around the curve, even if I got my full motion system on and I'm rolling through the curve and I'm feeling the weight transfer, this just adds a little more to it. And how dynamic it is matters too. It's not just pulling like a, you know, a dead weight. It's very dynamic on how hard I'm turning the car. If I turn it real hard, it pulls harder. So it's dynamic. So that gives you a sense of how hard you're, or rather how tight you're turning in the turn and all the stuff like that. So it does a good job, I think. I thought it would be kind of gimmicky, but in simulation, I think it, it has value. But yeah, you don't feel that like you don't feel like that when you're in a real car you don't feel the belts just tightening back and forth on you when you're turning the car around a turn like that but in simulation i can see where it has some value so i'm we're gonna i'm gonna elevate it from gimmick to uh, something that's actually useful as far as input so that's okay there now we'll talk about the heave now the heave if you've got a motion system this is kind of where i would not use it I, i've already kind of run it a little bit and it's just something that I don't think you need if you have a four point motion system where you have four actuators because you've got plenty of heave right there and it it doesn't feel quite right to me on when when my motion system's running the heave part of that is it's like it's not sinking it just feels like it, it gets in the way so I just turn it off that's something I don't run but I'm gonna let you guys see what it does when we go around some bumps here I want to go ahead and get down to let's go ahead and run first I'm gonna turn it up a little bit I'm gonna leave Sway alone because it's pretty it's pretty darn tight right now. It's, it's pulling really hard. So I'm not even gonna try to get more power out of that. Of course, that's subjective. Some people want it, some people want. Now I'm gonna turn heave. You can see I have it off in my configuration. So I'm gonna turn it on now. And I'm going to, I'm gonna kick it up to 50. Let's just say 14. Let's put it on 14. All right. So now we're gonna watch the heave. Now the belts are gonna get busy. And you're gonna hear them being kind of chatty as we're going over bumps and things. So let's see how that's working there. Again, it's just, it's subjective. If I was in a static cockpit, then okay. I don't have any heave, I don't have any uh, actuators, then I could see where it had some value. But yeah, it's, if you watch it, I'm just gonna kind of run here. It's kind of a smooth run through here though. We'll go over the, some of the bumpy part. Go over the curbing. You can see how it's moving when I go over the curbing. But down here on turn 17 is really where you can see these things working. It's pretty smooth down here on the last straightaway before we go into turn 17 and hit the start finish line straight. So let's go ahead and get down here and we can take a look at it. All right, so here we go through here and just watch that the harness as we're going over the bump. Okay, now we're going down the straight. All right, so I think you can see enough there of how the heave is working. They're pulling, and if you're going in a corner, the heave is still working too. If you're going over bumps in a corner, one belt tightens up because of that sway feature. You can feel it more on one side than the other going over the bumps. So that's, again, on a static cockpit, I think this is a good thing. But if you've already got a good heave system, in other words, a good motion system with four actuators on it, it's kind of redundant and just doesn't, it kind of messes with the other feel of the, of the actuator's heave, to me anyway. Now. You might be able to dial that in or out, but it's easier for me having the motion system that I do, I just turn it off and don't worry about it because I got plenty of heave already. But yeah, going around these transitions, you can feel it from concrete to the asphalt transitions that we went over. You can feel all that in the heave. And on a static cockpit, I think that would be something that you would want to not turn off because you can feel, you're getting more information. That's what this stuff is all about. Giving us more information about what the car is doing and letting us adjust and use that information to adjust the car accordingly and be able to control the car better really at the end of the day because the more you can feel what the car is doing the better we're going to be able to control it in simulation 
because in real life, of course, we've got G-force, and that helps us tremendously on what feeling what the car is doing, but we don't have that, obviously, in simulators. So, yeah, the more the better, depending <laughs> on what you have already. So, yeah, when I run this, I'm going to have the, the heave is going to be turned off because I've got plenty of heave already. But, yeah, there's plenty of power in here. We got it at 14. I'm going to turn that heave down real quick and get it back down to 10. There we go. Now, smoothing on this, you see I'm not even touching smoothing because it feels good to me. If it feels too intense, you can put some smoothing in. All right, here's what I will do though. I'm gonna take some smoothing out because there's plenty of it in there. I'm gonna take heave down to eight. We'll take some smoothing out of the belts down to, well, it was seven actually. These numbers kind of jump around a little. Okay, seven and surge, I'll take that down to seven. So we're just taking them all down together and see how that feels as far as the smoothing, taking smoothing out. It's probably just gonna obviously feel more intense. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll tell you, the surge doesn't feel more intense. It still feels just as smooth as it ever did. Let's see what the heave is doing. Yeah, it's it's kind of hard to tell. I, don't, I really don't sense a lot of change there. Maybe a little bit through here. Let me go down the straight. It feels a little more chatty to me on the heave, but the rest of it kind of feels the same. The surge and the sway, pretty much feeling the same. But yeah, I can tell the heave is definitely chattier than it usually is. Yeah, okay. So to me, the heave smoothing needs to be back on 10 right away, but I really couldn't tell much difference on, I read the 15, was it? Where were, we, where were we? 15, yeah, 10 and 15. So the rest of it was pretty smooth anyway. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put that back to 15. So I'm probably gonna run with this like this, but I will be turning heave off. So you, yeah, when I'm talking about it in the driving segment, when I'm driving at speed, I'm gonna have my motion on and make some comments about how it's blending with my waist belts or not. I think it will though. I don't think it's gonna be a problem tuning that in because there's a lot of availability of tuning in our software here. Sim Racing Studio has done a pretty good job with this, it seems like. We've got lots of, of range, if you will, to suit just about everyone, I would imagine. But we'll discover that once we get into the driving segment, and we'll do that next. We're in iRacing at Sebring in the Ferrari 488 GT3. And yeah, I wanted to do a static type of setup first to show you guys how this is working before I get into using it with my motion system turned on. And this is what 95 to 98%, maybe even more, of the people who buy these motor-driven tensioner systems will be probably be sitting in. So anyway, I've got everything turned on here. You're gonna hear some noises, and obviously you do, because we have those gearboxes in there, those reduction gearboxes, and I imagine what they are. And yeah, they're turning, the heave is making them chatter and louder and more active than they would be without the heave. Now, I'm gonna talk about the surge here. When you go into the braking zone, like right here, the first time you do that and these belts tighten up on you, the shoulder belts tighten up, it's a revelation as far as, wow, you know, you've never felt that before like running in your cockpit. And it's not only just an effect, it gives you information or data that you can use to understand what is happening to the car, how it's reacting to your brake pressure. And then of course, make your corrections or make your inputs accordingly so that you can get through the braking zones easily or quicker. And the trail braking part of it, if you go in hard and then you come easing off of it to transition over to trail braking, you can feel all this in the belt. Just like if you were strapped into a circuit car and you were in hard enough threshold braking and then you've got the car slowed down and you get ready to initiate turn in, you start coming back off, transferring or transitioning into your trail braking mode. So yeah, it does all that and it does it very well. So this is data that you can use to control the car, which is something that you've never had before other than in the steering wheel. Again, it's a big shock to your system the first time that happens, I think. I can keep it on the, on the tarmac here. So if you listen down, we're going down the straight here. You can hear this thing. When we're going around turn 17 a minute ago and just down the straight there, and you can 
see the belts are, are really moving quickly if you watch the little buttons on them, and that's the heave effect. And that's really what you're hearing here mostly. If you turn that off, it's gonna be much quieter. Now going through the turn, you can see there a left turn, the right belt tightened up, right turn, left belt, and here we go, the right belt's tightening up again because you can see the left one getting loose. Now that is the sway element. And that's where one belt tightens up depending on which way you're turning it or the other one does. And this is supposed to simulate G-force or give you an indication of how hard you're turning. And it does do a good job at that. If I'm turning real hard, it gets real tight on one side on the belt. And if I'm turning an easy turn like this one, coming out of that hairpin and turning again, it doesn't squeeze you as much. So it gives you an indication of the telemetry G-force that the game is sending you. So you can tell how deep or how hard you are into a corner based on that information. Now, that's something that you don't get in real life, obviously. You know, one belt's not tightening up, the other one's not getting loose when you're getting into a curve or you're going in through a, a high G turn. What's happening is your whole body is getting pressed into the side of the seat. You know, the side of your body on the upper torso and your thighs are all getting squeezed up against the seat. Now, the position of the belt might change laterally because you're getting compressed against the seat, but it shouldn't change very much because you're supposed to be strapped down very tightly into the seat. But in simulation, we don't have G-force, obviously. So this is something that's supposed to, you know, replace that. And it depends on the system you have. You got no motion, I would use it. When you have motion, you know, that's another thing. And we'll talk about that in a minute when we get to me driving it with the motion system. And again, it's all subjective. It depends on what you want. But the cool thing is you can turn things up, you can turn things down, you can turn things on, you can turn things off to adjust to your particular situation. Again, the heave gives us road texture and bumps and curbing and things like that. And that's obviously the loudest part of this system when we're running heave. So it's something that I'm probably not gonna be using in the motion because I've already got four actuators giving me all the heave that I could possibly want. So, but if you're in a static cockpit, again, it's a different situation. So you, you probably would want to run the heave to get the effect. Now I have my 60 OF platform turned on. So all of the DOFs are working. And first thing I want to talk about is the heave. You don't need heave when you have a system like I do with 60 OF in your seat belts. There's another thing that I noticed when I was using it with the heave on is I could feel the road textures, obviously in my direct drive wheel. And we have a wheel directly attached to a motor shaft so there's really no delay in that as far as the telemetry signal coming in we feel it right away same thing with my actuators on the each point or each corner of this chassis they are very fast and powerful actuators so i'm feeling that at the same speed i'm feeling it with the wheel but i couldn't get it dialed into where it felt right with the belts and not only that but because they are belts this web belt right so it's pulling on the buckle where it is around your waist and it has to go all the way around over your shoulder and down into the motors attached to the gearbox down there there's going to be a little delay in that when that pulls compared to what i'm feeling in the wheel and in the chassis itself so i really couldn't get them to sync up and to be honest you know it just didn't feel quite right to me then again that's subjective somebody else might love it who knows but i just turned it off not only did I turn it off, but it, I turned it off also because the, the noise went away. <laughs> so it's very chatty when the heave is on, as, as you saw in the first segment here, you know, when we were talking, when we were in the static mode, and that just goes away. So it's a much quieter system, kind of an added benefit when you don't have the heave turned on. But if you got four corners with actuators on them, I really doubt that you'll need the heave in it. So you can just turn it off, which is a good thing. So now we have the sway and the surge left, and like I said, the surge, getting that tuned in with the waist belt, I didn't know if I could do that, but I was able to accomplish that. So in the heavy braking zones, I'm feeling the pressure, same amount of pressure on my chest or my shoulders as I am around the waist belt, like you would in a real car. And in a real car, you don't feel just the shoulder belts tightening into your body. I mean, you do feel that, but you also have compression in the waist area as the G-forces push your body against those straps in the harness. And here, I was able to adjust that to where it felt like it belonged together, I guess. And I think it was easier to do because they're both web belts. <laughs> so they're, they're kind of stretching and working the same way as far as the same materials go, right? So I think that's why it was able to pull it off. So I was surprised a little bit, pleasantly 
that it worked together like that and I was able to get it dial in. So it felt as far as the amount of pull being equal across the waist and the shoulder belts, very much like when I have it just without the motors running the tensioner and just have the belts mounted to my surge tower. And yeah, it feels kind of the same, but a little bit, still a little differently though, because of well, obviously we have a gearbox pulling on the belt on the shoulders. So a little bit of difference, but again, this is all subjective and you know, you can go either way. You can turn the, the surge off and just tighten them down if you want to, <laughs> as long as the belt tensioner is active and it'll stay in one position when, when your body pushes against it. So you can do it that way too. Depends on what you want. The sway, okay, here's the sway. I could take it or leave it. Because we have full motion now, I'm getting pressed into the seat a little bit as, you know, as it rolls through the turn. And we have sway on this chassis where it kind of goes sideways when I get into an understeer condition. So the belt's pulling on you as you go through the turn is not something that I've ever really sensed when I, I really wasn't paying attention to it. But I really didn't sense that when I was in a real track car tightly strapped in going around some high g corners all i could feel was the compression of my body against the seat bolstering right on the on the upper torso and on your thighs that's all you really feel i guess if i was focused i might feel the belt slide laterally like i said before in the static when we're doing the static bit but yeah you're not really going to feel it pulling like these can although it's a cool effect if you want to use it i mean it depends on the person I've kind of turned it way down. You really don't see it working here because I'm, I'm not sure if I turn, ended up turning it all the way off or I just turned it down. I really couldn't feel it that much. But in any case, I preferred the way I have been running before. But then again, we're talking subjective stuff here. So I'm really feeling the surge more than the belts. Although you can see the belt there around that turn. The right one was a little bit tighter than the left, I think. So I may have left it on in this segment when I was shooting it. But I think at the end, I just ended up turning it off and just went with the surge. Again, totally subjective. Do it any way you want to. It's your system, right? But I just want to show you guys the differences and what I could and couldn't do or the way I ended up running it with a full 6-inch travel DOF system. So, yeah, I think this is a, a great system, especially if you're going to be mounting it to a static rig that's not moving or you have a static rig that has limited motion. Overall, this system does exactly what they advertise it to do. It has a lot of power. It's got plenty of speed and it has effects that can give you more immersion in your simulation driving. Final thoughts on the Tension R Shoulder Harness Tensioning Unit. This is the first motor-driven belt tensioning system I've tested. However, I have turned many hours under a statically mounted belt tensioning system utilizing the surge element of my 60OF PT actuator motion platform. Out of the box, this unit presents well with a good finish on the case and what looks to be a decent five-point racing harness in red. There is also a shoulder belt pad sewn into the webbing. This should provide extra comfort during long driving sessions. You can mount the tension R to either 4160 profiles or 4080 profiles. You can choose which one you need during the ordering process. I ended up mounting my unit to 4160 profile. The kit includes fasteners to get it securely attached to your cockpit. I also used a pair of guide rollers to route the shoulder belts at a proper angle to avoid the belts pulling straight down on my upper trapezoid muscles, which can cause pain and discomfort during long stints. There is a reason race cars have a bar mounted directly behind the driver's seat that attaches the shoulder belts to the roll cage structure at the driver's shoulder height. The included USB and power supply cables were long enough to reach my powered USB hub at the front of the motion platform. The calibration process is straightforward and easy to do using the Sim Racing Studio software. There are three different effects available with the Tension R unit, surge, sway, and heave. You can use them all at the same time or turn each one off and use the ones that you want. I think that most of the buyers for a motor-driven belt tensioning system will be mounting to a static cockpit with no or limited motion. This is where the Tension R system shines. It can provide a very immersive experience. The motors have good power and are fast enough to make their movements feel in sync with what you are seeing in game. You are in for a treat the first time you go into a braking zone. The belts tighten with a force that varies with the brake pedal's pressure, providing actual information that can be used to better understand what a car is doing under braking and react accordingly. 
When turning, one belt or the other will tighten with a force that varies with the radius of the corner. The heat function will allow you to feel the bumps and curbing, along with road textures. All of this is tunable in the SRS software. If you already have a motion platform, this system may or may not be something you would want to add. It depends on how many motion cues are available on your current system. I made some detailed observations about this in the driving segment of this review. Overall, the tension R belt tensioner seems to be a solid unit, with good build quality both outside and in. The look inside revealed a well thought out component placement and what looked to be acceptable circuit board designs. Overall, I think most would enjoy the effects that this system can deliver. It's easy to tune and has enough tuning range for most users to get what they need from it. One thing to be aware of is the noise levels that the motor gearboxes produce in use, especially if you have the heave effect turned on. It is not a quiet system. Thanks again for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you would like to help support what I do here at the SRG, visit my website at simracinggarage.com.